time for the Jewish nation, they will be saved from it with the redemption. And the prophet Isaiah said about God that whenever the Jewish nation goes through a difficult time, it is difficult for God as well. And the angel who stands in his presence, Angel Michal, has saved them. God has saved and redeemed the Jewish nation with his love and mercy and has picked them up and carried them forever. And so when I'm going through my difficult time and uh, difficult day, and I read those words, I go, okay, Hashem is with me. God is with me. All will be well. I don't know how. I don't know why. I'm too small to understand these things. But it gives me that feeling that uh, God is not far and distant. And just as we all feel the pain, God tells us very clearly, God is sensing this pain. God is not far away and God feels all of our pain. So what's he waiting for? I don't know why he doesn't finally bring the redemption. But uh, we're here to, uh, to demand and to beg and to uh, plead and ask God. It's uh, enough is enough. Uh, may this be the, uh, the prayers and the Torah study and the tzedakah that brings us to the time of the final redemption. And so I'd like to um, go to Rabbi Ruddle who is going to be leading us in the reading of Psalms. Well, thank you, Rabbi Marcus, and thank you everyone for coming, <clears throat> for coming and joining for this uh, stimulating event and, and lecture and Torah, prayer and charity. Um, we're gonna be reading chapter 20 in Psalms and Many of my community members, I'm sure many of you are asking yourselves the question, what can we do? Sometimes it seems futile to convince people or influence people on social media. Um, people are entrenched in their narrative. And so what we say with the Midrash tells us, we, we grab the craft of our ancestors. What did our ancestors do when there was adversity and trouble, persecution, or all kinds of humiliations and tragedies, they said these prayers to heal him. The Psalms from King David, who himself composed many of these when he was in deep distress, being persecuted and targeted by people who wanted to destroy him or kill him. And indeed, when we connect to God, which is what, who we're praying to, we really have the ability to have the most control possible. God is in control, but when we tap into the infinite godliness through our prayers, we connect with Jews around the world, and we have the most uh, control of the situation where we could beseech God to help our brothers and sisters that are suffering through the indiscriminate firing of rockets in, into Israel and from the terrorist organizations. So uh, please, uh, we'll read it together. You can read it in English or Hebrew. Let's do it in unison, because when we pray together in unison, it's magnified the power of our prayers. Let's storm the heavens for resolution and miracles and safety and security for our brethren. As Israel belongs to us, and these are our brothers and sisters, we're all one mishpacha, one family. Lam natseyach mezmar ledavid, yan chadinoi b'yem sara yisagev cha shemele yakayv. Yishlach Ezra Kham Mikodesh, Umitsyan Yisadeka, Yiskar Kalmin Chaisecha, Bailascha Yidash Nesela, Yitelecha, Hilva Becha, Bahalat Sasko Yamale, Niran Bishua Secha, Vishemelin, or Nidgal, Yamale Adina, I call Mishali Secha, Atoya Dati, Kiyoshi Adina Mishiha, Yane O Mishme Kacha, Big Burris, Yesha Yiminoi. Thank you so much, Rabbi Ruddle. And now we would like to introduce our dear friend, Sterney, we're actually cousins, Sterney Backman, Chabad of Glendale, Sterney and Rabbi Simcha Backman, you will lead us in the giving of charity, the giving of tzedakah tonight.
Sharni, you there? Sharni? Okay. What we'll do is we'll come back to Sharni and we'll introduce Rabbi Benny from Chabad Rancho Mirage to lead us in the singing of Ose Shalom. We'll join, join together and Rabbi Benny Lou in the Ose Shalom, the song of peace. Oh, say shalom bim roma, vuya se shalom aleinu, ve'al kol Yisrael, ve'imru, ve'imru, amen. Oh, say shalom bim roma, vuya se shalom aleinu, Ve'alakal Yisrael, ve'imru, ve'imru, amen. Yase shalom, maradi deram, yase shalom, shalom aleinu, ve'alakal Yisrael. Yase shalom, shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu, ve'alakal Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu v'yakol Yisrael. Yase shalom, daradi deram, yase shalom, shalom aleinu v'yakol Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu v'yakol Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu, v'yakol Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu, v'yakol Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu, v'yakol Yisrael ve'imru, amen. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. And I want to give a big shout out to Barbara Katzoff. You are such a great participant. <laughs> you make it so much fun. Thanks for being here, and thank you everyone for bringing here and bringing your great energy to our group tonight. It's a real treat to be here with everybody. And I see Sterney's back. So take it away. This is my cousin Sterney Backman. Hello, hello from Glendale. It's so lovely to be with everybody tonight. A great night for unity as we did prayer and Torah. And we'll do Torah some more. Grab your charity boxes as every good Jewish home should have one. And if you have some coins or dollars, anything will do. There will be many times told us the mitzvah of charity goes a long way. Every unity event, every Jewish event should have the three elements that the world stands on, Torah, tefillah, and staka, charity, Torah, and prayer. So we're going to do all three tonight. And when we do it in unity, as Rabbi Ruddell said, it's even more powerful. So as you give tzedakah, do a little prayer for peace, for, is, for our Israeli brethren, for health, and for the world standing on these three pillars to be in perfect unity and in proper, good foundation, steady and sturdy. All of us together actually have a cosmic effect. Feel it as we will learn some more together now. Thank you so much, Sterney. And we also want to welcome Gila Litvin from the Friendship Circle. Can you unmute yourself? Hi. Hi, Gila. I wanted to welcome all the awesome Friendship Circle alumni who are joining us from all over.
Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> this is uh, really wonderful. We done the, did these mitzvahs together, but uh, that shouldn't stop us from doing our own mitzvahs ourselves. Um, every time we want to, we feel helpless or hopeless, or we feel like, uh, what can we do for uh, the Holy Land? Um, consuming news uh, doesn't really help them very much, but doing a mitzvah really helps them a lot. And so with that, uh, we're going to turn it over to uh, the Posners from Chabad of Rancho Mirage. We're going to introduce our... We're going to introduce our wonderful, amazing speaker tonight. Before we do that. I see that we have a lot of international people, a lot of from out of state, good friends, because um, we're all one family. I want to welcome Marla, give you a shout out in Seattle, right? Welcome. We have Emily, who was a former Hebrew school student in Mission Vieja, who now is a mommy of three beautiful children in Utah. Welcome, Emily. So good to have you on here. And we want to welcome all of our friends who are on tonight. Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome. This is truly, truly an exciting moment. 3,333 years ago, tonight and tomorrow, is the day that we were given the instructions to get ready to receive the greatest gift of all, which was the Torah, three days before the holiday of Shavuot, which is coming up on Sunday night and Monday. As, one, as Brassi mentioned, one people with one heart, totally united together to receive this great gift. And tonight, we are trying to recreate a sense of that unity with our fellow Southern Californian Chabad and other organizations. And I just want to shout out, I know some of you heard this before, but we're going to just uh, say it again. Um, based with Salah with Rabbi Moshe Levine and Rabbi Menachem Kashansky, Chabad of Glendale with Rabbi Simcha and Stanley Backman, Chabad of Mission Viejo, our great Rabbi and Rebison team that just ran the prayer and tzedakah service. Um, Rabbi Zalman Abbasi, Marcus, Chabad of Mount Olympus with Rabbi Shalom and Rachel Arado, um, ourselves, of course, Friendship Circle Alumni, directed by Rabbi Michi and Miriam Ravnoy and led by Gila Litvin this evening, and the Giola Women WhatsApp group of Los Angeles, led by Mrs. Cyril Frankel. Um, when we had this opportunity, as Basi said, to plan this, we said, hey, listen, it's right before Shavuos. This is the energy of unity. It's always good to be united, but tonight is really tapping into this when our nation gathered together to get this gift. And we come back together and we say, we're ready, we're united, and we're going to inspire each other and ourselves to receive this gift anew. And tonight, we're honored to have with us Rabbi Chase Taub. For those of you that listened and uh, Googled his name earlier um, after we sent out our email. I'm not sure if anyone else did. You'll see the Rabbi Taub is very much well known worldwide um, column writer, author, lecturer. We had to kind of steal this like one hour with him. He's very booked almost every hour of every day. And um, getting ready for the Torah. There's so much to talk about, and Rabbi, we couldn't think of anyone better who has the skill to take these quite lofty kind of topics and bring it down to practical reality. So Rabbi Taub talks Torah, Rabbi Taub talks Tanya, Rabbi Taub talks addiction. He does a lot of things, but tonight he's going to speak of failure and success, purpose and distraction, and you'll let us know what you think at the end. Important, if anyone has questions, we welcome them. And you can use the chat box to put your questions down and they will be, Rabbi Taub will look at them at the end of his presentation. And Rabbi Taub, thank you again. It's over to you. Thank you. Okay, all right. Did I successfully unmute myself? That's the big question in today's day and age. Did I unmute myself? All right, that's how every speech begins nowadays on Zoom. All right. Um, wow. 
It's nice to be in Southern California. Yes, I uh, I get around now, you know, with the with the miracle of uh, modern technology. So we can go from coast to coast and from continent to continent, and it's just you know the flip flip of a button. So uh, here I am, back in sunny California. <sighs> We're getting ready for Shavuos, three thousand three hundred thirty-three years since the giving of the Torah at Sinai. You know, uh, before the revelation at Sinai, God was going around and he was looking for a nation to accept his commandment. And he went to the Edomites and he says, would you like my commandment? And they said, what's a commandment? He's like, well, it's something you got to do. And they're like, eh, no, that's going to cramp our style. No. Then he went to the Ishmaelites and he said, would you like a commandment? They said, what's a commandment? He said, well, it's something you got to do. And they said, I uh, know that's going to cramp our style. Uh, we'll, we'll take a pass on the commandment. And then God went to the Israelites. He went to Moses and he said, would you like a commandment? And Moses says, how much does it cost? And God said, it's a commandment. It's free. And Moses says, in that case, we'll take 10. So they're the Ten Commandments. Okay, so we're talking about the revelation at Sinai. There's a very interesting passage in the Talmud that describes what occurred in heaven right before God gave the Torah. Moses was up in heaven and he was receiving the hard copies of the tablets and the 10 commandments as inscribed on the two tablets of stone and the angels started arguing that if the jewish people will receive the torah god's perfect holy wisdom these people of flesh and blood they're going to take this perfect holy wisdom and they're going to mess it up they're going to mess it up. So uh, God told Moses, no, you argue with them, right? So, uh, you know, God was smart when he uh, was in an argument with the angels. He got a Jewish lawyer. So he said, you know, he told Moses, so you're Jewish, you argue. So uh, Moses was arguing with the angels. And he starts proving to them that the commandments don't apply to them. So he, he, he gives various arguments. He says, like, it says to rest on Shabbos. Do you guys work that you need to rest? It says to honor your parents. Do you guys have parents? And Moses is going through the commandments and one by one sort of showing how they're not applicable to the angels. But then the coup de grace, the final argument, is that Moses says to the angels, do you guys even have an evil inclination? An evil inclination, you know, that's that devil on the shoulder, so to speak, that we see in the cartoons, right? The selfish, animalistic drive that wants comfort and pleasure, even at the cost of doing the right thing. That's what we call the evil inclination. So Moses says to the angels, do you guys even have an evil inclination? Which is a rhetorical question, because the angels, of course, do not have an evil inclination, which is why they have no free choice. They are perfect robots. They do only what they're programmed to do. And uh, after that, God gave the Torah to the Jewish people. That's what it says in the Talmud. It's a really funny story because... It says, basically, Moses won the argument. I mean, as evident by the fact that God then gave the Torah to the Jewish people, Moses won the argument. But it's not clear how Moses' argument was a winning argument when it would appear logically that Moses' argument was actually exactly what the angels were saying. The angels were saying, God, you can't give this perfect holy wisdom to these imperfect people because they're going to mess it up. 
And then Moses says, well, you guys don't even have an evil inclination. We have an evil inclination. Well, yeah, that's exactly the angel's point. That's exactly what they were saying. They were saying, we're perfect. We won't mess it up. You're imperfect. You have an, an evil inclination. You will mess it up. And so Moses was basically like making their point. So how are we, how are we supposed to uh, understand this whole, this whole story? And, and that's really what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about the fact that you can't really understand the most formative event in Jewish history, meaning the giving of the Torah at Sinai, without understanding that our imperfection is not a bug, it's a feature. It's not by default, it's by design. And that Moses was able to win the argument with the angels by emphasizing our frailties, not by trying to cover them up. And if we'll understand that, we'll understand what the giving of the Torah at Sinai was. And we'll understand what our purpose here in this world is. Well, we'll come back to this, but I want to change the subject a little bit. You know, seven weeks ago was Passover. Shavuos is always seven weeks after Passover. In fact, it's the only holiday in the Torah that the Torah does not give the date of the holiday. It says uh, you count 50 days from Passover and then you're at, you're at Shavuos. So Shavuos is very connected with, with Passover. On Passover, we, uh, we had the prohibition of chametz. We didn't eat chametz. We didn't even own it. We banished it from our home. So we put it away in a closet and we marked it as sold. So chametz was like a real bad thing seven weeks ago. What's interesting is... Um, after we go to the trouble of cleaning our homes, selling our chametz, or burning our chametz, do you know what the most risk, the highest risk object in every Jewish home that has the highest risk of actually being chametz? Do you know what it is? Matzah. Matzah is made out of two things, flour and water. You know the ingredients for chametz? Flour and water. So after you go rid your home of chametz, you then you bring in a box of the two ingredients that make chametz. Oh, but no, don't worry, it's not chametz because we bake this in less than 18 minutes. You know, <laughs> and that's just a little bit too, uh, you know, intense for me you know like why does it have to be the very two ingredients that make chametz and we're going to say well but we're going to mix them together but don't worry we're going to bake them in 18 minutes or less than 18 minutes and then it won't be chametz how about we play it much more safe how about we don't take the two ingredients to make chametz let's do something different and in fact this what i'm saying is a uh, it's it, it's a discussion in the jerusalem talmud the jerusalem talmud says that um, it suggests perhaps we could make matzah. I mean, we know we have a mitzvah to eat matzah. It tells us to eat, the Torah tells us to eat matzah and Pesach to relive the, the, the Exodus experience. But the Jerusalem Talmud says, hold on a second. Why do we have to use wheat flour, or spelt or barley or rye? You know, there's five species of, uh, of flour, uh, grain, according to Torah. Uh, um, wheat, barley, oats, rye, spelt. Um, why, why use those? Let's play it safe. Let's use like um, corn or rice or, you know, okay, so you're going to say we don't eat kidneys, but biblically there's not a problem with kidneys. And for the Sephardim, they eat kidneys. Or, you know, let's say uh, you want to avoid the whole kidneys thing. Okay, fine. So quinoa. Okay, we'll make little quinoa cakes or, or, or some other flour, like potato flour. Okay, you know, like the, the kosher Pesach cakes, you know, the, you know, the, the, the shahakal cakes, the, the potato flour, or the, the, the tapioca flour, whatever it is. But let's just not use the same exact ingredients that make chametz. Please, can we avoid that? And that, that's, that's what the Jerusalem Talmud says. And the, the Jerusalem Talmud says, no, can't work. So 
somebody is direct messaging me right now and asking what's Chametz. Chametz is 11. Chametz is the stuff that is regular bread. Everyone knew that, right? Yeah? Can't, can't see anyone's reactions. Anyways, um, what was I saying? The Jerusalem Talmud asks, you see, by the way, I'm being very careful to say everything in English, except for Chomets, because I figure that people know what Chomets is. You know that more American Jews have a Seder than go to Shul and Yom Kippur? It's one of those Pew study findings. So I figure that uh, people know what uh, Maxwell House is and they know what uh, Chometz is. So uh, what we're talking about, the Jerusalem Talmud asks, why don't we just avoid the whole issue that, oh, hold on a second, I'm getting uh, more direct messages. Okay, thank you. He says, yes, everyone knew what it was okay so the jerusalem talmud asks um why don't we just avoid the whole issue and use other ingredients and uh the jerusalem talmud answers and says because the torah tells us to guard the matzahs meaning to be vigilant to not allow them to become chametz and from that, we learn that if it can't become chametz, it can't become matzah. By the way, nobody direct messaged me to say what matzah is. Does everyone know what matzah is? Anyways, if it can't become chametz, then it can't be matzah. It's a funny concept. Meaning, if it can't become the very thing that is prohibited, then it can't be used as a mitzvah. That's a deep concept. And uh, Chassidus, teachings of uh, the Hasidic masters, explain that that's really a metaphor for all of life. If the soul remains in heaven, it has nothing to lose. There's no risk. The holy soul stays in the holy heavens and uh, everything's going to be fine. If it comes down here to this world, there's a lot of risk. There are distractions, temptations. The truth is very hard to find. And the, uh, the lies are very attractive. And yet, if the soul doesn't risk it all and leave heaven and come down to this world, it can never truly serve God. Why? Because if the soul remains in heaven, then it's no better than an angel. And remember, God wasn't interested in giving the Torah to angels. An angel is a robot, an automaton. It has no free will. It's not a relationship. You cannot have intimacy with someone who can't break your heart. When God gave the Torah and the angel said to him, if you give them the Torah, if you reveal yourself to them, if you let them know your deepest desires, your 613 desires, 248 likes and 365 dislikes, they're going to break your heart. And God said, I'm aware of that. And that is the price of a relationship. Vulnerability is the price of intimacy. 
God told us exactly what he doesn't like, which gives us the ability to hurt him. You know, think about it. When a Jew wants to lash out at God, he knows exactly what sandwich to eat, right? They, they have a deli sandwich called the Reuben, right? It's milk and meat and bacon and like only, a, who was this, who was this Reuben? Reuben was a Jew. Right, because <laughs> all he was an atheist who came up with the most offensive sandwich. No non-Jew came up with it just on accident because it tasted good. Right, a Jew knows exactly how to strike out at God. Actually, I'm, I'm saying it as a as a hypothetical, but there's actually such a story, a real story that happened with um, Rabbi uh, with Rabbi Steinsaltz from uh, Jerusalem who just passed away. But uh, there was a story that he was giving a class to academics, and uh, many of them were, were very secular. And there was this one professor that he was inviting to the class, and the guy declined. He says, I'm, I'm not religious. So Mr. Steinsaltz said, it's okay. Many of the people who attend the class are not religious. So the guy said, but you don't understand the extent of my irreli irreligiosity. He says, I eat pork on Shabbos specifically. Bedafka, he said. <laughs> so Steinsaltz says, okay, so I have my way of keeping Shabbos. You have your way of keeping Shabbos. <laughs> in other words, there's no Gentile in the world who's like, okay, uh, hold on a second. It's Wednesday afternoon. They just brought out a pork sandwich to the, to the table. No. Waiter, wrap this up. Let me bring this out Friday night at Kiddush and make a statement. God revealed himself at Sinai. That means he revealed his likes and dislikes to frail, imperfect, impetuous human beings who could weaponize that information. And the angels warned God and said, don't do it, God. And Moses said, no, that's exactly what he wants. You guys can't even disappoint him. So if it can't become chametz, it can't become matzah. If there's no potential for disaster, there's no potential for mitzvah. For mitzvah means connection. You can be. An angel, an angel is good because God made it good. But that's not a relationship. That's not intimacy. There's no risk. There's no vulnerability. One of the words in English that uh, is really right. I mean, not every word in, in every language is, is a true word. Words arise because of convention, because people agree to use those words. And uh, the holy tongue, Loshan Kurdish, is the language of creation. That's, that's a true language. Every word in, in the holy tongue is the word that the creator uses for that thing. But then once in a while, even in a regular uh, mundane language, they get it right. And um, one of those words is the, it's the word human. Human is a, is a very rich word and a very accurate word. I, uh, I remember I used to, uh, not, not my current uh, house, but uh, I used to live in a neighborhood, very eclectic neighborhood. There were all types of ethnicities there. And <laughs> I had a neighbor who was Lebanese and he really, he was a funny guy. He tricked me and he told us that our other neighbor um, had a 20 pound bag of hummus on his front lawn. So uh, I, I said, said to my Lebanese neighbor, I mean, I, I know he's Lebanese. He knows what hummus is, you know, Jews eat hummus, Lebanese eat hummus. So he showed, he said, pointed to it. I looked across the, the street 
and it was a, it's a 20 pound bag, it's a giant bag, said hummus on it. I'm thinking, who, who, who gets 20 pounds of hummus, you know, like in a bag on, on this front lawn? So, uh, so finally I asked my, my neighbor, I said, what is the, like, <laughs> I know sometimes you go to Costco and, you know, you buy in bulk, but this, this is crazy. And I, I asked him, what, what's the 20 pounds of hummus? I asked my other neighbor. It was like, you know, like, uh, I don't know what ethnicity was. Just, you know, regular, you know, what do you call it? You know, average, you know, a generic American, you know. So like, what's with the 20 pound bag of hummus? And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, Danny showed me. Danny's my Lebanese neighbor. You have a 20 pound bag of hummus on your front lawn. It's like, I don't even know what, what is hummus. I mean, you know, it's like that chickpea stuff. It's like pudding. It's like, I'm trying to describe hummus to, to, to the other neighbor, to Charlie. <laughs> He's like, I don't know what hummus is. I'm like, the bag, the bag you had in the front lawn, 20 pounds. He's like, hummus? I'm like, oh, is that how you, I don't know, maybe you pronounce it as hummus. I'm like, hummus. And finally, it clicked for me. I, I know what hummus is. <laughs> I mean, I've been to a gardening store. H-U-M-U-S, humus. Humus is dirt. <laughs> so I went over to Danny. I was like, what are you doing? You're making a fool out of me. I went to Charlie and I told him we have a 20 pound bag of hummus. It wasn't hummus, it was humus. He was cracking up. Yeah, you know, whatever. He had, uh, he had fun at my expense. Humus is dirt. It's a kind of soil. They use it in gardening and stuff. H-U-M-U-S, humus. The word human is related to the word humus. To be human means to come from the dirt. And it's 100% correct. The word in the holy tongue is Adam or Adam, depending on your pronunciation. Alf, Dalad, Mem. And what does that mean? So a lot of people say it means a man. It doesn't mean a man. First of all, uh, Adam was neither male nor female. He got separated or it got separated later into male and female, and then they married each other. But it doesn't mean man. Adam means from the earth, from the Adama. Adama means earth, or Adama. So Adam means the being from the Adama. The best translation would probably be earthling. Hello, earthlings, take me to your leader. <laughs> right? When the little green men come down the flying saucer, that's what the hello, earthling. The word for human in the holy tongue is, is earthling, of the earth, because that's the, the narrative. When God made man, he took dirt, and he formed that dirt into the shape of a man. He breathed within it the breath of life. You know, by the way, about these scientists once, they wanted to show God they don't need God anymore. We could create a man. And they opened up a Bible just for spite. They were reading the lines from Genesis. God took the earth from the four corners and he formed, into it, they formed it into the shape of a man. And as they were reading from the Bible, they were doing all this, these scientists. And they, were, they made this anthropomorphic image of this, this mound of dirt. And they had it hooked up with electrodes to this big machine, you know, this big, uh, this, uh, big electric machine. And they were about to throw the switch. And, and they, re they read from the Bible. And God breathed within the, 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 the dirt, the, the soul, the breath of life. And they're going to flip the switch and send an electrical charge into the dirt. And it's going to enliven it. It's going to stand up. And it's going to make a living, breathing, talking human being just like God created. And, and they're about to flip the switch and enliven this, this mound of dirt and turn it into a man. And as they're about to flip the switch, a voice booms out from heaven and says, ah, not so fast. Get your own dirt. At any rate, why is the word for a human the word dirt? And it's really, it's related to other words that come from the same root as well, like um, humility. What is humility? Humility is the graceful exception, accepting of our limitations. It's related to another word, humor. Humor is the ability to laugh primarily at yourself. So human, humus, humor, humility, they're all related concepts. To be a human as opposed to an angel means 
to have the ability to laugh at our imperfection, to realize that we're dirt. There's no shame in being from the dirt. Being human is a dirty job. You want to stay clean? Stay in heaven. You'll be like an angel. You'll stay clean. But you want to really be intimate with God? You want to be able to give him his desires, fulfill his desires? You want to be in a relationship? Then you got to be ready to get dirty. And that means the soul comes down here in a body with its temptations and its habits and all of its imperfections. And yet, without that, there is no relationship. We may, we may as well be angels. And for that matter, there's no purpose for God to give us his holy Torah. So if we, if we talk about what are we celebrating Sunday night? You know, Sunday night is the anniversary of this revelation. What are we really celebrating? We're celebrating the fact that God chose imperfect beings who he knew would fail. He knew we would fail and said, I want to be in a relationship with you, not because it's safe, but because you are my beloved. And in order to have an intimate relationship, we have to risk getting our heart broken. If there's no risk, there's no reward. If it can't become chametz, it can't be used as matzah. I mean, they sell robots now for people who want to avoid the uh, disappointment and the inconvenience of a human relationship. And it's, uh, it's much easier in a, certain, in a certain way, but it's not a relationship. God didn't want angels. You know, one of my uh, teachers and mentors uh, passed away a few months ago, Rabbi Dr. Tversky, Allah Shalom, may he rest in peace. And um, he was just very amazing <clears throat> in being able to convey very deep thoughts in a very practical way. And uh, I remember a story he told that, uh, so when he was training to be a psychiatrist, he had to take a personality test. Um, and one of the questions was, are you capable of committing murder? And he answered, yes. And it was actually a red flag question. <laughs> so they took him aside and they said, what's, you know, What's this? You're capable of committing murder. So he says, yeah, capable of committing murder. They said, well, you want to talk to us about that? Like, we didn't know you were such an angry guy. He says, look, the Torah says don't murder. Now, who's the Torah speaking to? I'm not speaking to someone else. It's speaking to me. Why would the Torah tell me don't commit murder if I'm incapable of doing it? Obviously, the fact that the Torah tells me not to do it means it's something that I could do and I need to be told not to. In other words, what, what Rabbi Dr. Tversky was conveying was Hashem didn't give his commandments superfluously to a bunch of angels who would keep them anyway. He gave his commandments to people who would be struggling with, with, the, with the fulfillment of the commandments. He gave his commandments to us because they are difficult, because it's not something we would necessarily do automatically. And, and, and the fact that we have a commandment doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. To the contrary, it's probably going to be hard. I see a lot of times, unfortunately, you know, people get discouraged 
when they try to take strides in their spiritual growth, in their religious growth, in their mitzvah observance, and, and they feel like they're failures. They feel that they've, you know, they took on it, they made a resolution, and then they failed. And they say, well, you know, either they, they feel guilty, you know, Jews are, you know, we know how to do that, or the cognitive dissonance kicks in and we rationalize. You know, you don't want to feel bad about yourself. So then you just tell yourself, well, it wasn't important anyway, because, you know, if it's important and, and I didn't do it, then I have to feel guilty. So then in order to not feel guilty, I tell myself, well, it wasn't important anyways. No, it's not really so, you know, so it's not such a big deal. So, so I don't keep kosher, right? But he wanted to keep kosher. A person made an earnest resolution. I want to start keeping kosher in the home, out of the home, whatever it was. And then he failed. And then he has, to, then he tells himself, well, I can't live with my failure. So whatever. So it's not important. How about this? Why don't you say to yourself that, it is important. And the fact that you failed is totally expected. It's expected. And if God knew that you couldn't fail in keeping kosher, he would never bother to tell you to keep kosher. <laughs> so rather than feeling discouraged by your failure, why don't you feel encouraged? Why don't you realize that it's something that actually has value precisely because it is a struggle. I'm just using keeping kosher as an example. It could be anything. It's not, there's nothing specific about that mitzvah. It could be any mitzvah. The point is that um, when we celebrate Shavuos and we celebrate the fact that the infinite God revealed his will at Sinai. It's not as technical as people make it sound. It's not like this, uh, this judge came out and he put up a, a sign with a list of laws on it. It's not like that. It's more like, um, well, I'll tell you exactly what our sages say. They say that the revelation at Sinai was a wedding. That God was the groom and the Jewish people were the bride. Moses and Aaron were the, the escorts, the, uh, the ones who accompany the bride and groom. And the tablets, the two tablets were like the ketubah, like the uh, marriage contract. Mount Sinai was the, was the chuppah. And the reason that we, that we refer to it as a marriage is because when we enter into a relationship and we reveal our deepest desires, you know, when we let our beloved know what makes us tick and we say, you know what, this hurts me. And this makes me feel really, really good. It's not like we're putting a sign on the wall with a bunch of rules. Now keep those rules. And if you don't keep those rules, you're fired. No, we're sharing this information because we know that's the price of intimacy. If I tell the person what really makes me tick, they could break my heart. They could let me down. But if I don't tell them, then I don't allow them to ever really connect to me on that level. So, We refer to Sinai as a marriage because really what it means is God revealed what he cares about. God revealed what he likes and dislikes. Like I told you, 248 likes and 365 dislikes, right? That's 248 plus 365 is 613. 613 mitzvahs, you have do's and don'ts. So 248 do's and 365 don'ts, instead of calling them do's and don'ts, call them likes and dislikes. God let us know, you know, if you take these leather boxes with parchment inside, it says Shema on it, and you bind them with straps on your, on your hand and on your, uh, on your head, you know, talking about the tefillin. Oh, that's like buying me flowers. That's like sending me chocolates. Melts my heart. I love it. Oh, and by the way, if you take wool and linen and you weave them into a single fiber, oh, I hate it. That's like nails on a chalkboard. Don't ever do that. I wouldn't have known that if God wouldn't have told me, right? 
God revealed himself means he revealed his likes and dislikes. Think about it. What does it mean for you to reveal yourself to somebody else? What does it mean to give somebody the right to know you? It means to let them know what you like and dislike. To let them know your desires. That's what intimacy is. Somebody once said, intimacy is into me see. Into me see. What does it mean, into me see? You know, you know, make an operation, open heart surgery, look at look at my uh, look at my vital organs. Into me see means I reveal to you what I like and what I dislike. Not my needs, because my needs, you could guess. You could guess my needs. Needs are fairly practical. Like I need to eat. I need to breathe. Needs are practical. Needs are universal. You can pretty much guess what people need. But wants, desires. Desires are far deeper than needs. Because desires are idiosyncratic. They're unique to me. And you would never guess it if I wouldn't tell you. Would I know that the infinite one is bothered by wool and linen if he hadn't told me, right? And by the same token, would I realize that what the infinite one really desires melts his heart, and makes him feel so good and loved is uh, leather boxes with parchment and straps? I wouldn't have guessed that, not in a million years. So God takes this highly sensitive information. And to whom does he reveal it? To his beloved. And who is his beloved? Not only are they not angels. They're not even souls in heaven. They're souls in bodies. See, all of us at one point, you know, we, we weren't born yet. Our souls are eternal. So they were around even before we were born. So at one point we existed as disembodied souls, souls in heaven. Why didn't God tell the souls in heaven to keep the Torah? Why did the revelation have to happen in the physical world? Could have happened on a spiritual plane. But no, it took place in a physical location at Mount Sinai, at a place we know we, we, we know roughly the location. We don't know exactly the location of Mount Sinai. I mean, it's d debated, but we, we, we roughly know where it is. It's a physical location. The Torah describes it. I mean, in other words, why couldn't it have been some type of a thing that, you know, after you die, your soul goes to heaven and you graduate to some level of enlightenment and then you're given the Torah there. At that, What does the Torah say? We don't know because only the souls in heaven know about it. That could have been. I mean, you're saying, well, that doesn't sound Jewish. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't sound Jewish. But in theory, that could have been. Maybe maybe that would have been Judaism. That nobody knows what you're supposed to do. But if, uh, if, 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 if you leave your body and you go to heaven, then you find out the rules. But, no, that's not what it is. What did God do? He told the rules to the souls when they're in the situation where they're most likely to break the rules. So what does that tell us? It tells us that it wasn't so much that God wanted the rules, it's that he wanted the relationship. And in order to have the relationship, he had to be vulnerable and tell us what he likes and dislikes. So what I'm saying is, it's a whole new way of looking at, at Shavuos and looking at at the revelation at Sinai, instead of seeing it like, well, that's the day when, you know, God made our lives a lot more complicated because he, you know, told us we have to have two sets of dishes. Instead, look at it like this. That was the day where God said, I want an intimate relationship with you so much that I'm willing to share with you things about me that you never would have guessed. And I'm going to do it even though I know that you're going to mess it up. You're going to mess it up. And that's okay. 
because if you couldn't even mess it up, then it wouldn't be a relationship to begin with. I want it to be from you. I want it to be yours. There were once two Russian peasants in a tavern philosophizing. And one said to the other, he says, you know, Ivan, I don't understand how taxation works because the czar sends the tax collectors all around the countryside to assess how much people own and then to assess how much money they owe and to collect the money from them and bring all the rubles back to the capital in uh, Petersburg. I don't understand. In Petersburg, the czar has a mint and he makes the rubles. Why can't he save time and money and staff? And instead of going to the trouble of collecting rubles from everybody, he should just make more rubles. So uh, the other Russian peasant says, he says, you know, Ivan, they were both named Ivan. He says, you know, that's a great question. I have to think about that. So they drink, they drink some more vodka and they pondered. And then finally he says, Ivan, you know, it's not a good question because you're missing something. The czar doesn't want rubles. You're right. If he wanted rubles, he would just make more rubles at the mint. Tsar doesn't want rubles. He wants your rubles. <laughs> but think about it like this. You know, a woman wants flowers from her husband for her birthday. Okay, so let's say FTD florists shows up randomly and they say to this woman, we just made a drawing of all of our customers in our database and you were randomly selected to get flowers today. And they bring her the flowers. Oh, perfect. That's what she wanted. She wanted flowers. So she should be happy. <laughs> but it wasn't about the flowers. Now, if it were something she really needed, something practical, like she's thirsty and she needs water, what does it matter who brings the water? <laughs> you need the water, right? But it wasn't about a practical thing. It was a romantic thing. So it wasn't that she just wanted flowers. She, she could go out and buy flowers. She's a competent adult. She could buy the flowers. It's not that she wanted the flowers. She wanted her husband to send her the flowers. It's not just that Hashem wants these things to be done. It's that he wants them to be done by his beloved. His beloved who has the option of not doing it. So that when his beloved chooses to do it, his beloved is actually giving him himself or herself. When you choose to do something, and it's a struggle, and God said, don't kill, but I could kill. I'm giving God myself. I'm choosing to put aside my will and to do his will. If there's no struggle, if there's no, if, if, if there's no inner conflict, then what have I given him of myself? If it were about practicality, I'm telling you, he would have given the Torah to the angels. The offer was on the table. He could have snatched it up. He could have said, perfect. If I give the Torah to the angels, it will all be done flawlessly. But that's not the point. For God to give commandments to angels and angels to perform the commandments would basically be like God doing the mitzvahs himself. Because the angels don't have free will. They just do what they're told. So then it's like him doing it to himself. It's like tickling yourself. It doesn't work. God would get no pleasure from such mitzvahs. He gave the mitzvahs to us because we can mess it up. And therefore, when we don't mess it up from time to time, we're giving him ourselves. So the next time you're feeling like a failure or you're bemoaning your spiritual imperfection, just remember that it's not a bug, it's a feature. 
This is exactly what God wanted. He knew exactly what he was getting into. This is what he chose. He chose you. Mitzvahs that really, truly come from you. I'm going to take a peek at the chat, see if see what came in over here. Let's see. Let's see what we got. Okay. Oh, it's hard to see this. Hard to see the chat. Oh. Okay, let me take a look here. Okay, this is about technical stuff. What's this, my Lebanese friend? Oh, okay, good. Oh, that's great. So I uh, look, I'm causing peace. I caused you to text your Lebanese friend. That's great. Great. You can tell the, uh, the hummus story. Okay, that's awesome. That's great. By the way, I mentioned Rabbi Dr. Tversky before. Do you know who paid for his uh, medical school? Danny Thomas, the Lebanese uh, American okay. comedian. Yeah, yeah. Danny Thomas read an article about Rabbi Dr. Tversky in Life Magazine, I think, and he, uh, he paid for his uh, paid for his medical school at uh, Marquette. Okay, it was like this Lebanese theme over here. Okay, all right. Um, a marriage is also an analogy, a very good one. Without risk, there's no deep learning and evolution of our souls. Yeah, that's right. God knows how to set us up with the people who know how to. Uh, Test us. This is a wonderful perspective, very inspiring. Thank you. Okay, especially at this difficult time. Thank you for this perspective. We are giving up our will for that of Hashem. And from this, we grow in our enlightened truth. Yes. Okay. All right. I know a guy who knows Danny Thomas. Okay, awesome. That's beautiful. All right. Uh, what else? Oh, Jewish guy from Beverly Hills, BFF with Danny Thomas. So amazing how you are mentioning things, which I myself have also blogged about. You know, there's like this collective consciousness. That's how that happens. Okay. Of course, you know, if people are interested in more of this, uh, these concepts over here, um, we encourage you to uh, continue your studies. Um, the ideas that we're talking about here are uh, really best explained in the Hasidic teachings, especially in Tanya. And I want to encourage anyone who's connected with any of the Chabads here on this meeting that you ask your uh, local Chabad about uh, Tanya study, the opportun opportunities to study Tanya. I believe uh, that uh, there was a Tanya printing recently by one of the, one of the Chabads. But uh, if you're interested to learn the marriage manual, so to speak, how to deepen our relationship with God. I highly recommend the text of, of Tanya. There's a question here about what about a tzaddik? Yeah, tzaddik, well, that you're, I'm assuming you're talking about tzaddik is defined by Tanya, so that's, what, that's sort of like a Tanya question. First of all, go to the Tanya class. But second of all, um, you wanna know about a tzaddik? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, God really gets a deeper satisfaction from the uh, conflicted people than from the people who have no challenges. There's no question about that. And that's why the Talmud tells us, and Maimonides actually codifies it in halacha, in Jewish law, that in the place where a penitent stands, that means somebody who messed up and then got back on track, even the perfectly righteous cannot stand. They cannot attain that level. Um, but if you're going to ask, well, you know, does a tzaddik have any value? Well, I'll tell you like this. Yeah, because at the end of the day, even though they have an easier time in this world, they're still in this world. So they're not disembodied souls. They still have to deal with physicality. They have to eat. They have to drink. They have to have families. Um, and... So that little bit of physical distraction is enough to make their service have some teeth to it, so to speak. But definitely, there's no question that those who are more challenged by embodiment are actually achieving a, a deeper connection. Okay, let's... Uh, 
what's the, what else do we have here? Um, sometimes, and in fact, recently, I've given up some Jewish friends because of their flaws that have deeply pained and offended me. How did we, how do we learn to forgive these flaws? Oh. Well, like I'm talking about here, you know, God didn't give up on us because of our flaws. He chose us because of our flaws. We, we need to regard people's imperfection compassionately. Now, I want to I wanna make it clear. Some people are not safe for us. And that's a different discussion. And sometimes in order to protect yourself, um, a relationship can't really continue or it has to be very uh, marginalized, sidelined. And that does happen from time to time. Uh, but if it's not that, if it's not about boundaries that you need in order to protect your sanity and your safety, it's more about like, well, I, I lost my respect for you because I found out you were imperfect. Let me tell you like this. We all know that we are imperfect. And yet we continue our relationship with ourselves. Well, how can I not continue my relationship with myself? Well, I'm saying we're really into it. Like we actually spend a lot of focus and time on our relationship with ourselves. Like we'll stay up at night thinking about, you know, cringeworthy stuff that we did 20 years ago. You're not thinking about a cringeworthy thing that some stranger did 20 years ago. Why are you thinking about the thing that you did cringeworthy 20 years ago? Clearly you still have a very <laughs> vested interest in yourself. So it's interesting as much as we're, you know, aware of our own flaws, we're still interested in ourselves. <laughs> We still are uh, pretty focused. And it's the same thing with, with our friends, that we can be aware of their flaws and still be interested in their lives and what's going on. And we can, we can express interest and check in on them, make sure they're doing okay. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Let's see what else we got here. Um, uh, So many questions here. Uh, oh, wow. Some of these are direct questions. I'm not sure if they're private because some of them say they're private. So I'm sorry if you sent a direct question. I'm on the fly here. A little bit hard for me to, to pick and choose which ones are private and which ones aren't. Uh, this one says, I think it's important to kill off the perfection as part of ourselves. Make shorter lists. It's okay to realize we're perfectly imperfect and it's okay. We don't learn from the easy stuff. Struggle equals, struggle equals a path to vulnerability. I love it. I sign on to that. I co-sign that. Okay. Didn't Hashem choose us in spite of our flaws? Uh, no, because of our flaws. And, and, uh, that, and if, if it was in spite of our flaws, I have to rewrite my whole speech, but I don't want to rewrite it because I already gave it. <laughs> he didn't overlook our imperfection. He was in love with our imperfection. All right, what else do we got here? Um, if he chose us because of our flaws, which ones? <laughs> I like that question. <laughs> what do you mean, which ones? We are inherently flawed. It's not a particular flaw, like uh, eh, he talks too much. <laughs> no, it's that when the soul experiences embodiment, all of a sudden, its priorities change. Let me explain something. When the soul is in heaven, godliness is the concrete empirical truth. The notion of God is the most undisputable and real idea there is. That's the soul in heaven. And if you would ask a soul in heaven to imagine creation, a created being, a created realm, the soul would say, hmm, that's really weird. That's a very abstract notion. That's a philosophical idea. I'd have to imagine such a thing, right? The, the idea of a creator, 
the idea of God, that's concrete, that's empirical, that's, that's our reality. But the notion of a creation, beings with free will, and they, they don't even know that they're creations and they, 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 think they, they think they're separate, they think they have autonomy. That's so weird. How do I even imagine such a concept? That's the soul in heaven. Soul comes down to a body and what happens? It gets bombarded with physical stimuli and not only that, but the physical stimuli take over so that now our entire sense of what's real or unreal is based on our five senses. So now what's real? What's the realest reality? Whatever I can touch, taste, feel, see, smell, meaning the phenomenological universe, the world of our five senses. This is empirical. This is true notion of a god who created it that's philosophy for that you have to have an imagination so you see what happened the soul went from one from one premise of reality to the exact opposite premise of reality that's that's what it means it's a descent why do we say the soul descended into a body like it put on a parachute and jump from a plane. It's not coming from a physical place. So why do we say it descended? It didn't go down. It's not like there's gravity that pulls it from heaven. When we say a soul descended, what we mean is that its premise for what is real and true went from God-centered to self-centered. So you, you ask, what flaws was God attracted to? No, it's not specific flaws. It's the, the one underlying general flaw, which comes from the fact that our basis for operating here in, in the embodied state is self-centeredness. Our default is self-centered. When a baby is hungry at three in the morning, he has no guilt about screaming at the top of his lungs to wake up the whole house because if I'm hungry, the whole world's gonna wake up. Embodiment means to be self-centered. Therefore, when we are selfless, meaning when we're in an intimate relationship, whether with a spouse or with God, we've actually chosen to do it. It's not automatic. And therefore, when we choose intimacy, we are giving a gift. We're giving the most precious gift. We're giving ourselves. Because if I keep myself to myself, then my default setting is selfish. But if I give myself to my beloved, that means I change the whole default setting. And now I'm putting you first. I'm putting your desires ahead of my desires. So you want to know what flaws is he attracted to? It's not the specific flaws. It's the fact that self-centered beings can choose to experience God-centered living, even if it's for a moment, even if it's one action a day. Okay, I'm not sure how long I'm supposed to go on for. It's getting late, but I'll uh, maybe I'll take two more questions and we take a peek at the at the chat. Rabbi well, Tao, can I show yeah. you? I, I took the liberty of unmuting myself. Thank you. Uh, can I trouble you to put, uh, give us a couple of bullet, uh, bullet points on, uh, on, on, your, uh, on the things that you said tonight? Because you had a couple of one-liners that were good zingers. If we could have a couple of those just to go away with. You just want the zingers? Start off with the zingers. Um, how much do they cost? They're free. I'll take 10. That was the first zinger. Um, 20 pounds a bag of hummus. That was a funny story. Um, what else? What else was funny? Or you want like the, 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 the profound stuff? Like, um, Some of the serious ones were good also. The one about the serious the default, ones? The default and the, um, uh, I forgot already. One of them was about the default <laughs> versus the uh, something or other. Human humility, humus, 
humor. Should have written it down. Okay. That wasn't so profound. Okay. Just a little bit of something uh, to like to 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 uh, encapsulate, uh, kind of like a kid, sir, on what you said. Uh, that's the, the, the old uh, Mark Twain story. If you want the 90 second version, then I need uh, a week to prepare. Okay, 90 second version. We're about to celebrate Shavuos. It's the anniversary of when God revealed his innermost desires to imperfect beings. He had the option to play it safe. He didn't play it safe took the risk of vulnerability. And for our part, we respond to that by giving as much of ourselves as we can to him and not condemning ourselves for being imperfect because he's the one who chose it. He could have easily bought a, uh, a robot, but instead he married a, an imperfect spouse. Thank you. And thank you, Rabbi Tao. This has been a delightful evening. Um, if you want, you can have Rabbi Ta Chase Tao 24 7. Just go to 24 6. I apologize. Just go to YouTube. You'll see plenty of them there. Um, and it's just really great to be able to um, tap in to the, the wisdom, the humor, the light touch that goes with it. Of course, um, it's good to get together with your local community and uh, learn what you can there. Uh, it's our learning here that, uh, that helps the soldiers uh, 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 on the borders of Israel. And I don't mean that simply in a mystical sense, but in a very physical sense, it gives them strength to know that they're fighting for something real. They, they know that they are defending us to be proud Jews. Here we, where we are, and we show that when we're able to get together and learn Torah. Thank you. And just to conclude, thank you, Rabbi Tav. Thank you to all of every one of you that showed up this evening to unify with one another. We are now ready to receive the Torah. And while we're at it, we can bargain for whatever we want with God. And we wanna be able to internalize the Torah but we want to be able to really negotiate for the things that we all need so desperately, starting with what's front on, on our hearts, Israel's safety, but together with safety for all people worldwide, the, the world that we're waiting for, that Rabbi Tav described, the perfection of the imperfection to be completed. And that's, you know, it's coming up to an, our anniversary. Let's prepare what we want to be asking for. So tonight was a great opportunity for us to get ready for that. And it's the Rancho Mirage community that excitedly welcomed a brand new Tanya that just came back bound and inspired this evening. And we are starting a class on May 26th in our local community. So all of you Rancho people, please let us know that you're interested. You'll find out more about this. One more website you could go to, Rabbi Taub has a website called Soul Words dot org soul words w-o-r-d-s um dot org which is fascinating really practical apply kabbalah and we can wish everyone to be able to receive the torah together as one nation this monday be there at your place to hear the ten commandments please god we'll all be together in the perfect world jerusalem or the perfect world maybe right now that we'll celebrate together this shavuos the culmination of the marriage where it needs to be. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi Tal. Thank you, all our fellow Chabad participants in this evening. And good Shabbos and good Yom to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sameach, everyone. Thanks, Sameach.